and I call on the Minister Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, our 10-year mental health strategy paints a clear picture of the kind of Scotland I want to live in. A Scotland where people can get the right help at the right time, expect recovery and fully enjoy their rights free from discrimination and stigma. The strategy's guiding ambition is that we must prevent and treat mental health problems with the same commitment, passion and drive as we do physical health problems. I was honoured to be appointed the Minister for Mental Health in June of this year to build upon the work of my predecessor, Maureen Watt. While I've only been in post for a short time, I know from my experience as a mental health nurse the commitment and dedication of the people who make a difference in mental health care every day across Scotland. Presiding Officer, today sees the publication of the first progress report on the mental health strategy. In the first period the strategy, of the strategy, many of its actions have already been implemented. Out of 40 actions in the strategy, 13 are complete or nearly complete, and 26 actions are in progress. There remains only one action to carry out a progress review of the strategy in 2022 that for obvious reasons is yet to get underway. However, there are three particular actions in the strategy that I will single, single out for attention now. Under action 16 of the strategy, we invested £175,000 to establish a perinatal managed clinical network. The managed cl clinical network's expertise and diligent work has directly informed a commitment in our 2018 programme for government to deliver a stronger network of care and support for the one in five new mothers who experience mental health problems during and after pregnancy. That equates to 11,000 women per year. This will see £50 million of investment in perinatal and infant mental health over the next five years. In addition, over 1,000 people have already received a distress brief intervention in Aberdeen, Lanarkshire, Borders and the Highlands. The distress brief intervention programme is funded by £3.4 million from the Scottish Government and provides the offer of a next day contact with a trained worker from a third sector background to anyone presenting in distress to A&E, police, ambulance services and primary care. And we also announced in the programme for government that this initiative will be rolled out to under 18s in 2019. And last month on the 29th of August, I had the pleasure of launching our new transition care plans, which will help young people move more smoothly from CAMS to adult mental health services. The transition care plans have been entirely designed by young people in dialogue with clinicians and they're a shining example of what can happen when we listen to the views of our young people and act accordingly. Those are just three of the headline achievements that are summarised in the report. They are examples of where specific actions in the strategy are already making a real and tangible difference to people's lives. It's important to say that the 40 actions contained in the strategy will not in themselves completely deliver on our central vision. They act as valuable and necessary levers to create the change that we want to see, but getting to our ultimate vision and achieving our ambitions requires work beyond this set of commitments. There are five pieces of work I want to mention specifically, and I think they are all fundamentally important. Firstly, there is the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force, chaired by Dame Denise Coya, and supported by £5 million of additional funding. Dr Coya has dedicated her summer to talk with children and young people, their families, services, agencies and practitioners, and she published her initial recommendations earlier in the month on our whole system's approach to mental health services. Her work will help to implement the recommendations from the Rejected Referrals Report, which was published earlier this year. Dr Coya has already started work on a blueprint for how services can better meet the rapidly changing need that we see across Scotland. And the task force will convene its first meeting next month. Secondly, there is the Youth Commission on Mental Health. Young people are spending 15 months on an in-depth investigation of child and adolescent mental health services and they will do their own research, identify issues that are important to them, speak to the experts, policy makers and service providers about the solutions. And more than this, the youth commissioners have been invited by Dr Coya to be co-chairs of the task force. I think this is an inspired move and will keep the voices of children and young people at the centre of this work. 
And thirdly, there is the Suicide Prevention Action Plan, which we published on the 9th of August. It sets an ambitious target of reducing suicides by 20% over five years and contains 10 actions, and it's backed by an additional £3 million. And we've already established the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group, chaired by Rose Fitzpatrick, and that group will meet for the first time tomorrow. And fourthly, there is the See Me's national campaign launched on the 18th of September. This is the biggest conversation we have ever had with young people in Scotland on what mental wellbeing means to them. Harnessing the power of music to hear people across the country talk about how they feel. And I'm sure that the results are going to be especially valuable to Dr Coya's task force. And lastly, our 2018 programme for government has mental health at its very heart. It contains a package of measures to support positive mental health and prevent ill health. These new actions build upon the mental health strategy and will be backed by a quarter of a billion pounds of additional investment. This investment has a clear focus on children and adolescent mental health services, including school counselling. All of this is reflected in the report, which demonstrates progress on the strategy's 40 actions and towards achieving our central vision. It is the framework set by the strategy, together with other work I've mentioned, that has helped to create the current sense of purpose and momentum on mental health that we see across Scotland. Across society, we see a constantly evolving understanding of good mental health, mental distress and mental ill health and well-being. In the past, many people were unwilling to or unable to discuss their mental ill health and to seek appropriate support and treatment. And this is thankfully changing. However, I want to go further in working to overcome the stigma that can be associated with poor mental health. We also need to ensure that the public's understanding and expectation of mental health services is accurate and appropriate. The services that are being delivered must also better reflect need. We know that there is a gap between how services are currently configured and some of the overall needs of the population. And this is often too great a focus, there is often too great a focus on crisis and specialist services. For both adults and children, there need to be new models of support that are less specialised, available for more people, and that are delivered across different settings and services. We know that changing the location and nature of services and support requires the development of skills and capacity of the workforce who will deliver these services. And this means giving staff across health and other sectors the skills and confidence to ensure they are sensitive and responsive to emerging need and ways of delivering services. And we also need to put in place approaches which are preventative and deliver early interventions where we can. It means ensuring that access to mental health professionals is straightforward and easy to navigate for the individual so that the right help is available at the right time. Related to this, we also know that the workforce must grow. Through Action 15 of the strategy, we're committing significant investment to delivering an additional 800 mental health professionals by 2021-22. We are doing this in partnership with integrated authorities, health boards, local authorities and key sectors, recognising the different set services and settings where people can present while in distress. And finally, the role of data and information is another area where there is significant scope for improvement. We need to move away from the current focus on waiting times and workforce statistics and instead use evidence to identify areas for improvement, what works and what hasn't. Measuring patients' outcomes and experience will also be important. And Action 38 of the strategy, the launch of a quality indicator profile and mental health data framework, will be key to this. Presiding officer, as I said at the start, we've come a long way since March 2017 when the strategy was published. The report laid before Parliament today summarises that progress and does so by looking at what is happening across the whole system. And of what the report describes is making a contribution to what will be a fundamental change. Ensuring parity of esteem between physical and mental health and meeting our vision for the strategy will require us to work together to reduce stigma around mental health, to develop innovative and new ways of working and in doing so see that Scotland's mental health services are among the best in the world. I commend the report to the Chamber and I will be happy to take questions from members. Thank you very much. And our first question comes from Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. I welcome the commitments made by the Scottish Government in its recent programme for government 
We all want to see mental health receive the focus it so desperately needs. However, I feel like this statement is missing the point somewhat. Since the strategy was introduced last year, we've seen CAMS waiting times at their worst on record. We've seen an audit into rejected referrals, highlighting a consistent rate of one in five children and young people being rejected for treatment. And an audit Scotland report describing children's mental health services as complex and fragmented. We've, had, we've heard many warm words, particularly when it comes to early intervention and prevention, but things don't seem to be moving in the right direction. And when I've asked about additional mental health workers, community link workers, school counsellors and nurses, I haven't got anywhere fast. Detail seems to be lacking. Interestingly, the Minister states that we need to move away from the current focus on waiting times and workforce statistics. But surely these figures are necessary so that we know the strategy is heading in the right direction. So can I ask the Minister, what is she suggesting as an alternative measure of progress? Can I ask the Minister when we will see the delivery plans for the recruitment of additional school nurses and counsellors? And can I ask the Minister if she truly believes that the commitments made in the, the programme for government will see a real step change, particularly when it comes to early interventions and preventions? Minister. Uh, I thank Annie Wells for her um, question there. I think it's rather disappointing that she's not able to welcome the progress that has been made in the 18 months. Stakeholders involved in ensuring this progress have been NHS, social care workers, third sector organisations and other stakeholders. Um, and uh, she also um, wasn't really listening to what I was saying in my statement. When she asked about CAM services, she'll be aware that we have set up a task force under Dame Denise Coya, which has been working over the summer. The task group will meet next month, and that will be looking at wholesale changes within the CAM services. Mary Feed, be followed by Alison Johnson. Presiding officer, can I begin by thanking the Minister for Mental Health for advance notice of her statement. Everyone wants to see mental health on an equal footing to physical health. And the reality for the Scottish Government is that they are nowhere, achieving, nowhere near achieving that par parity, regardless of their warm words. We welcome the appointment of Dame Denise Coya in chairing the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force. However, the recently published Audit Scotland report of Children and Young People's Mental Health tells us that services for young people are complex and fragmented. And with CAMS featuring so heavily in the programme for government, can the Minister ensure the Chamber that funding for mental health workers in our schools will not be met from existing mental health or education budgets? And can she also give us um, assurances of how um, the transition care plans will be monitored given the already existing problems with the CAM service? We also welcome the treatment that 1,000 people have received thus far in Aberdeen, Lanarkshire, the Borders and Highland to tackle the mental health of drug and alcohol abusers. Given cuts to alcohol and drug treatment over the last decade, when will the Distress Brief Intervention Programme be rolled out across Scotland? And will funding be increased year on year to tackle areas of high deprivation and poverty, which result in higher levels of drug and alcohol addiction? Minister. Uh, I thank Mary Fee for her answer. I, I hope I'll be able to ask, answer most of your questions there. Uh, yes, it is additional funding that was um, announced in the programme for government. Um, I am pleased to hear that she welcomes the transitional care pr uh, plans that uh, were launched last month. It was certainly a, a piece of work um, that was done by young people themselves uh, with the support of clinicians. And when I was at the launch, they were extremely proud of the work that they had done. And I have written to all of the health boards uh, expressing my expectation that they will be using those care plans in that transition period from CAMS to adult mental health services. But they can also be used at other, uh, other points of transition too. With regard to uh, the distress brief interventions, um, we will be evaluating that uh, programme. It has been extremely warmly welcomed. Um, my own local police force have spoken to me on several occasions um, about uh, how well received it has been in Lanarkshire. Um, and as uh, Mary Fee will be aware, we are also rolling that out to under 18s. Um, over a thousand people have benefited from um, having those interventions and the feedback that we've been collecting has been extremely positive. Um, so once there has been an evaluation, then we will obviously be looking at how we take that programme forward. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you and I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. 
The Minister spoke of the delivery of an additional 800 mental health professionals to support A&E, GP practices, police station custody suites and prisons. But have training places been increased to allow for the further 430 councillors now committed to schools, colleges and universities? And is the commitment to provide a further 250 school nurses also being reflected in extending the number of training places? Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Alison uh, Johnson for her question. Yes, we have made a, a commitment to um, the additional mental health workers. We're currently working with uh, chief officers of the integrated authorities on developing this commitment, and this includes obtaining detailed workforce plans, um, which will provide information on workforce allocation, the location of the workforce in 2018 to 19, and details of the trajectory towards the 800 total by 2021-22. And we expect to receive these plans for further analysis um, by the October recess. Um, we, uh, integrated authorities have, have been in, uh, devolved responsibility for health and social care for their areas and therefore they are key um, in playing their part in this plan and to take, in, to take into account um, local needs. Uh, we are working in collaboration with other relevant partners um, to ensure that it is the, the best use of this workforce um, and uh, localised plans uh, will need to be made to meet the, the, the local population and make sure that we're uh, effectively working with partners um, to ensure that we have these uh, workers in place. Uh, we have increased um, nurse training. Um, there will be an additional 2,600 extra nursing and midwifery training places over the next four years, and that's as part of a wider package of measures to accelerate uh, supply of uh, newly qualified nurses and midwives. And we're focusing on priority areas, which include mental health, maternal and child health, and also for remote areas, particularly in the north of Scotland. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I too am grateful for early sight of the Minister's statement. Um, Liberal Democrats are very grateful to see the 800 mental health workers begin to be recruited. But can the Minister specify exactly what role that will they fulfil? Are they talking therapists or are they signposting people into interventions? And will the Minister also take this opportunity to tell Parliament how she intends her government to respond to the call by Sir Harry Burns in his review of NHS targets, which said we should be routinely capturing adverse childhood experiences so that we can direct support to those children. Minister. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to Mr Cole Hamilton for his question. Um, the, as, as I said in my previous answer to Alison Johnson, we are currently working with uh, Chief Officers of Integrated Authorities on delivering this commitment um, and making uh, detailed work plans uh, which will include um, where that the work, where the, excuse me, where the workforce will be, and I think that's it's really important that we work to local plans because this is not going to be a one-size-fits-all. Um, as regard um, the adverse childhood experiences, this government is investing in perinatal mental health services as well as in infant mental health services um, to try and uh, support families um, so that we reduce the risk to children. And we've also rolled out the Family Nurse Partnership, which is also working with vulnerable families to reduce the risk of ACEs. Emma Harper to be followed by Donald Cameron. I welcome the Minister's statement today. Can the Minister give a commitment that the Scottish Government will continue to engage with organisations such as the Rural Mental Health Forum and Rasabi to ensure that we can further explore options of tackling social isolation and loneliness in rural parts of Scotland? Minister. Uh, the Rural Mental Health Forum has been established to help people in rural areas maintain good health and well-being. This forum will help develop connections between communities across rural Scotland so that isolated people can receive support when and where they need it. The forum has been provided with £50,000 of funding this financial year. And the funding has been jointly provided by the mental health and rural portfolios, demonstrating the cross-cutting nature of the forum's work. Since 2016, membership of the Forum has grown from 16 to 60, and the Forum has agreed upon three outcomes to deliver, uh, one being a much improved understanding of the need and unmet need for mental health support in rural Scotland, 
evidence of how to better overcome barriers to accessing and seeking support and therefore enhancing people's mental well-being in rural Scotland and better informed rural and health policy due to specific evidence and support from the forum members. Donald Cameron to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Recent figures show that over a fifth of CAMS patients in the Highlands and Islands region have not been seen within the 18-week target over the last year. Given the issues around mental health provision in rural Scotland, what more can be done to improve such dire statistics in uh, the Scotland's Highlands and Islands? Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Cameron, for your question. As, as I've said earlier on, this government recognises that um, the, it is not acceptable for people to be waiting for a long time to be seen by mental health services. And that's why they took action to set up the task force under the, uh, the chair of Dr Denise Coya. Um, we got her initial um, recommendations last week and her task force will meet next month and they will be looking at how we um, revise and change CAM services so that people can get access to services that they need quicker and those who need specialist services can be fast-tracked to be seen by those specialist services. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Anas Sauer. Thank you, President Officer. Just this week, we've been given more stark reminders about the devastating impact that bullying often of our young people can have on lives, families and communities. Let's be clear, bullying in any forum, in person or online, is not acceptable. Can the Minister outline what support has been given to schools to be able to recognise and support young people whose mental health has been impacted by bullying? Minister. I agree entirely with uh, Fulton McGregor that bullying of any kind is totally unacceptable and must be dealt with quickly and whenever and wherever it happens. Education authorities and all those working in our schools have a responsibility to identify, support and develop the mental well-being of pupils with decisions on how to provide that support taken on the basis of local circumstance and need. Local authorities will be using a range of approaches and resources to support children and young people with their mental and emotional well-being in line with local needs and circumstances. Since 2014, the Scottish Government has provided £6,000 per year to the Education Scotland to roll out mental health first aid training for children and young people to local authorities. And the aim of this is to train staff within secondary school communities in order to increase their confidence in approaching pupils who they think might be struggling with a mental health problem. And this training will complement the range of mental health strategies that are already in place within local authorities. And that's our word to be followed by John Mason. The Mental Health Minister unbelievably said in her statement that we need to move away from the current focus on waiting times and workforce statistics. That in the face of the worst CAMS waiting times on record, the highest suicide rate across the UK, a sky-high vacancy rate and with a desperate need to recruit hundreds of more staff, does the Minister not understand that the way of moving the focus away is by meeting the standard, treating patients on time and employing more staff? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Sarwar. I, I, um, I recognise, and this government recognises, that mental health services are, 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 not, um, are not good enough for, for our young people, which is why we have set up a task force under Dame Denise Coy, as I've already said. The previous Minister for Mental Health met with a number of NHS boards where the current delivery against standards continues to fall short and the latest statistics show that five of these boards show some sign of improvement but we need to go further. Um, our mental health strategy is investing £150 million into services over five years and it sets out clearly how we can reshape service delivery to benefit patients and this includes £54 million to help boards improve their performance against waiting time targets by investing in workforce development recruitment and retention and service improvement support and we're already funding Health Improvement Scotland to work with boards on improving uh, an improvement with ISD analysts embedded in the boards and NHS Education Scotland's programme of investment in workforce capacity building. John Mason to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you. I think uh, some people with mental health issues find it quite difficult to ask for support, uh, for example, face to face with their GP. Uh, can the Minister say if there's other ways that people can access these services? Minister. 
Uh, thank Mr. Mr. Mason for for his um, for his question. There, there are many ways that people can access services. Um, we have a breathing space, which is run by NHS 24, a confidential telephone um, phone line. Um, they can also access services online. We have rolled out um, CBT, a computerised CBT programme, to all NHS boards. So there are various ways that people can access services. And there are also um, a great many third sector organisations where people can access help, such as Samaritans, um, if they feel that they are in mental health difficulty and don't feel able to uh, approach their GP. However, I would encourage anyone who feels like that to try and go to see their GP because they are a uh, best place to be able to signpost them to services locally. Brian Whittle to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think similar to the suicide strategy, the Scottish Government seems to be focused on trying to deliver a service to those caught in that poor mental health spiral. Uh, as vital uh, as that is and as crucial as that is, I wonder if the Minister recognises that unless a whole system approach to health is adopted, which looks at the root causes of poor mental health, like poor nutrition and inactivity and chronic pain and obesity and isolation and alcohol and drug addiction. With all the evidence uh, from, from uh, Mental Health Scotland and Sam H, the system is ultimately going to crash. Minister. Well, I think it's interesting that Mr Whittle left poverty off of that list, mm. considering um, what the UK Tory government is doing in terms of rolling out universal yeah. credit and putting a lot of people yeah. into debt and poverty, people having to access food via food banks. Um, but, I say, but you chose not to mention that. However, what I will say is that the mental health strategy does look at physical health, that it does look at things like uh, smoking cessation, screening and activity, and there have been programmes set up under, under the um, mental health strategy um, committing to improve physical health inequalities of people with mental health problems. Uh, smoking cessation, for example, NHS Lothian, um, and uh, have uh, been... Um, have a tobacco control action plan which was published on the 28th of June which contains commitments to raise awareness amongst medical uh, professionals and healthcare staff of the significant impact that smoking can have on mental health medications. There are two projects currently running on screening. Um, the first is by NHS Dumfries and Galloway to improve the uptake of breast, cervical and bowel screening in people experiencing homelessness or with mental health problems through gaining an understanding of their barriers. And in NHS Lanarkshire, uh, they're reviewing options to increase the uptake to cervical, bowel and breast screening services for the homeless population in Lanarkshire. And the act of living becomes achievable, ALBA, is a new and unique behavioural change project which links in with existing physical activity provisions to enhance sustainable individual physical activity engagement through behaviour change. And the aim is to increase physical activity levels for people living with mental and or physical health conditions in order to improve their mental and physical health and wellbeing. And the results of that in, uh, the ALBA intervention will be available in September 2019. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide an update on Action 33 of the Mental Health Strategy, which relates to the needs of people with learning disability and autism? Minister. Uh, yes, I can. The review to consider whether the provisions of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 fulfils the needs of people with learning disability and autism, uh, chaired by Andy Rome, is underway. There's a strong emphasis on reaching a broad range of stakeholders and seldom heard groups so that the real issues can be fleshed out and considered. This will mean that several stages of engagement, as well as providing the right supports for people so that it will be, so it will be able to uh, record a range of views and experiences, making the review truly accessible. Um, it's therefore crucial that this review is truly inclusive and that this work is open and transparent. We want people to see and understand and participate in the work of the review. And the first of the three public engagement phases commence this month. Thank you very much and uh, apologies to Mr Stewart and Mr Lyle, can't call any more speakers. Uh, we'll move on now to the next item of business which is a debate on motion 14059 in the name of Ivan McKee on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements. And I invite all members who wish to ask a question of Mr McKee, oh no sorry, who wish to speak at the debate, I might wish to ask a question of Mr McKee too. All members who wish to participate in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. <laughs> 